Hello, it's Scott Manley here. By now, you have probably all heard that the Mars rover Perseverance has successfully landed on Mars. Yes, that is a great relief because this is the second time that we've tried the uh, very Kerbal spot sky, uh, sky Crane mechanic. And yeah, it has worked successfully to place a vehicle on the, the surface and much more on target because this time it had an active navigation system, which we'll, we'll we can talk about. But um, yeah, I haven't been able to make a video about this because, well, firstly, I've been very busy uh, with my day job and getting kids to scout camp and stuff, but also just um, they haven't released very many pictures. I mean, we understood that straight after landing, they would get a couple of images as quickly as possible. During the landing, they don't really have a good direct line of sight, so they would be relaying data from the uh, via the Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter, right? They would have satellites in orbit, and these would be taking data from the low-gain uh, antenna and relaying that to Earth. It's called bent pipe telemetry. And these have a limited time when they're above the horizon. In that time, they delivered two and a quarter images. We got a thumbnail from the forward Hascam and the rear Hascam, and a quarter of an, a proper image downloaded, and that was it. These images were very small, they um, black and white, so you didn't really get to see much, but you got to see enough to show that the vehicle was on the ground. You could make out some terrain in the distance, some rocks very close by, and of course, the framing of the covers that were there to protect it, because during landing, even under rockets that are way above you, there's a lot of debris going around. So anyway, having confirmed touchdown, there was a press conference to talk about how they're all happy that everything's down and to expect more data soon. And the next day, we got a nice little press conference with like a handful of images. Like not even, I think I can currently count the number of images we have got from this spacecraft on the fingers of, of hands. But we will expect more. So we have uh, a color image from the front hazard cameras. And you, in one case, you get to see a really nice close up of the wheel sitting on the surface. You can see some rocks in there with little pits on them. Not sure whether those are like volcanic rocks or the vesicles have been eroded or anything. But um, most importantly, though, we got an amazing image from the descent down, uh, down look camera showing the rover hanging meters above the surface of Mars as the v, as a sky crane is slowly descending to a touchdown. So this is an amazing image. This is, and it's actually only going to be one image from a much longer movie. So it's great because it's only like a couple of meters above the surface. You can see the dust getting thrown around and blown around. And uh, you can also see the cables coming up that are supporting it. Now, there's four cables in this image. Three of them are load-bearing cables from the bridle. Uh, the fourth is a data cable, which is, of course, sending the data from the sky crane down into the rover because it's where the cameras are, right? There's multiple cameras on the uh, sky crane stage. And those are that's going down into it. Now, if you were listening to the JPL raw stream, that's where you got to hear the um, the mission controllers and everyone talking and describing the descent. That was that was by far the best stream. I know there was a great um, public stream by uh, NASA that had a lot of people talking about how they were inspired by space missions and stuff like that. Whereas over in the JPL stream, they were talking about numbers, telemetry, and reading out the numbers and. There was a great deal of excitement when we heard the phrase Tango Delta touch down. But you know, I should clarify, I heard that and I was like, yes, we're there. But that that isn't really the case because that's the equivalent of Neil Armstrong or Buzz Aldrin saying contact light. That was T Tango Delta is a sort of internal phrase to say we've got rover wheels on the surface of Mars, but we haven't properly landed yet because from that point, they still had to confirm that it was stable on the surface then cut the cables, they had to cut the bridle cables, and then a couple of seconds later, they would cut the data cable and the sky crane would fly off. So that was when the proper touchdown happens, when the, the Mars rover stopped wobbling for, and the sky crane had achieved a safe distance. That was when they actually called the landing, just for those uh, that are interested. So yeah, we are currently waiting for a lot of images to come down from the multitude of engineering cameras which are going to be were used during the descent. These are these are engineering cameras which many people compare to GoPros, but technically 
They are Fleur, which is a company... Fleur is like a forward-looking infrared, and this is a company that makes machine uh, you know, video solutions for infrared and invisible wavelength. And these are machine vision cameras for industrial automation. So they're pretty small. They're, they're very similar to GoPros. They're just designed for industrial environments. They have four of these, I believe, or maybe actually have more than four, but they have four directions that these things point. They have a bunch looking upwards at the parachute being deployed that's on the descent stage. There's a number that are on the de uh, descent stage looking down at the rover, One on, some on the rover looking up at the descent stage, and a bunch on the rover looking down at the ground coming up. And between all of these, during the descent, we are expecting 28,000 images or thereabouts. And you know, all these engineering cameras aren't just for pretty pictures. I mean, they're there to actually do a little bit of science, but they're really there for the engineers that are trying to solve the problems of landing on Mars. That's why there are cameras that are pointing at the parachute to watch how it deploys at supersonic speeds. And perhaps more importantly, the cameras looking downwards will, will show the interaction of the rocket plumes with the surface of Mars. Because if you are trying to land something much bigger, say a starship on the surface of Mars, you want to make sure that you're not going to throw debris everywhere and make the vehicle unable to land, like destroying the land that you're trying to land on as you're trying to land on it. I think it's Monday before we actually get to see that. And maybe what we see on Monday is just the thumbnail versions. It, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're not really getting the, the view into this program that we would like to. <laughs> in fact, I've seen people complaining about how slow these releases are happening. The, the Mars the official raw data download site still only has two and a quarter images, despite other uh, images having been released. But these are not the raw images by the looks of things. We also got a fabulous image from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which not only was it providing a uh, relay for the telemetry, it was also taking an image and it showed the vehicle under the parachute towards landing. We've only seen like a low quality JPEG version the full quality version hasn't yet been released, so I'm hoping when that happens we'll be able to actually see things like the heat shield falling away and, and other data. I'm really looking forward to this, let's be clear. <laughs> yeah, um, this is something that's very exciting, but uh, it's very hard to talk about it because we don't really have that much data. As of right now, yeah, they're going through their post-landing checklist. I think about now they should be starting to think about folding up the mast cam. So the mast, ca the mast, sorry, the mast. The mast has most of the major science cameras on it. So the, image, uh, the images that have been released so far have been things like navigation cameras or hazard avoidance cameras. These are low slung ones, kind of like backup cameras as some people describe them. They're down very near the ground and they're in pairs so that they can actually provide high quality images of rocks and they can make sure that they're not about to drive into something when they're driving under like autonomous mode. They're on the front front has cams and the rear has cams, although I like to call those ass cams. And uh, on the mast, that's where you have the real science cameras. And the science cameras are very different. These are, uh, these are the ones that have multiple filters in place. They do all the science. So, and so, yeah, there's like a, a bunch of other, I think there's like 23 cameras in total on the entire vehicle and a bunch of them are discarded after by the descent stage. There's one that is on the rover which is used for the landing navigation where they pick the landing site and divert it towards it. That's essentially useless now because it's designed to focus at a distance and now it's like inches from the ground so it, it can't work. By the way, I, I, heard, I saw a bunch of people during the um, descent, or after the landing, there was a report that they were 35 meters from the nearest boulder they can identify from orbit. And a lot of people took that to mean, wow, they managed to land within 35 meters of their target. That's, that's not actually what they're saying there. What they're saying is that the autonomous navigation put them no closer than 35 meters to a, a hazard that they could identify from orbit. The descent system, what it did was it took a photo of the area, figured out where it was in the map, and then 
they had a predefined map that said these areas are red, do not land here, these areas are green, land here. And that's what it did. So 35 meters is actually, the bigger that is, the better it is. It seems that they're landed in a pretty good place. I've seen, you know, the geologists will tell you they're excited. I, I'm honestly not enough of a geologist to know where the least interesting place to land on Mars would be. Uh, I suspect the least interesting place would be on top of another spacecraft. Um, that would be kind of catastrophic. I don't know how that would happen. But hopefully, if all goes according to plan, there will be another spacecraft trying to land in this region in the coming years because... This is a precursor mission for sample return. And it's going to be taking samples, putting them in little test tubes, and caching them on the surface. And then years later, we're going to have a rover come along, pick these up, load them onto another spacecraft, which will carry them to another spacecraft in orbit, which will carry them home. This is going to be a decade worth of science, at least. Um, but right now, you know, they're just in post-landing operations. They are checking out their stuff. They've folded the cat and the uh, mast up probably about now. They'll be folding up the antenna, figuring out where they are, figuring out how to point that. They will be switching over the software because the rover came down and it would be running the software that was needed for the descent and landing. Now it's there, they can delete all those files from memory and switch over to the ground operations only. So that'll be over the coming few days. They've successfully talked to the Ingenuity, or Ginny, the uh, helicopter. So that's technically a separate spacecraft. It's currently connected by a cable. That's how it's getting all its charging. But they can talk to that separately and make sure that it's healthy. Uh, I believe we're talking, you know, over a month before this actually gets to position where it will be able to fly and yeah, looking forward to that a whole lot. I'm hoping that it gets, they say it could fly up to four times. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, they get some sort of mission extension there because this thing is far too cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's, that's the state of things. I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have any fancy insights or anything for you. There was one cool, somebody from JPL tweeted out an image of their desktop showing the range control phase of the flight. And uh, I initially mistook the uh, angle for the range control as the lander trying to traverse towards the surface. But this is actually uh, during during the hypersonic descent on, with the heat shield, the vehicle is forced to turn, right? It has an offset center of mass that causes the vehicle to turn one way or another. And so it does these roll reversals, weaving its way towards the target that it wants. And if it needs to go, if it realizes the target is further away than it expects, it can roll so that it gets a bit of lift. And if it's, you know, if it's going to be closer than it expects, it can roll downwards to drive it down. And if it just is at the right distance, it can weave left and right to try to put itself there. So that's what these roll, these 60 degree angles I was remarking on are talking about. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what else there is to talk about, but hopefully we'll see more on Monday. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.